Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of Awesome Astronomy for August 2014. It's summertime, and the living is easy, fish are jumping, and the cotton is high. But even if your daddy isn't rich and your mum looks like the back end of a route master, you're welcome to join us as we jet off to the 24-7 party island that is astronomy. We have packed our suitcase fit to bursting with news of strange looking comets and cosmic dust. Throw away that airport chick lit because we have none other than Thierry Montmerle of the IAU joining us once again. Stamping our passport to the skies, we have a five minute concept about noctilucent clouds. And of course, we have the duty free selection that is questions and answers. So, doors to automatic and cross check, would passengers remain seated until the light is out? And please ensure your hand luggage is stowed correctly. Of course, this plane is not flying solo and serving you his complimentary nuts is Ralph. That has to be the best and most contrived opening we've ever done to a show. Congratulations to you, sir. Yeah, and how the hell you squeeze into that stewardess uniform, I'll never know. Never realised you were a size 8. <laughs> anyway, what have you been getting up to in July? <laughs> Well, you've been wearing a nice trim sailor's costume each time we record, so I thought it was about time I stepped up to the plane. <laughs> anyway, I've um, just got back from a wonderful weekend of tapas, barbecues and tons of booze in the Peak District National Park where we had solar observing in the daytime and some nice views of autumn to come with the Andromeda Galaxy and Perseus Double Cluster at about three in the morning. So thanks very much for that, Jules, if you're listening. And Damien came along too. You need someone to serve the drinks and fan you in the sunshine. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I've also been writing an article for the US magazine Astronomy on our recording at the Herschel Museum a few months ago. So that's about the great eyepieces that were shown in the 1920s to be even better than William Herschel thought they were when he designed them. Um, it's about the, the Caroline Herschel letters and exhibits and the pleasure of being in that garden where the mm. planet Uranus was discovered. And I think that'll be out in the next edition of Astronomy magazine if you want to take a read. Now, I know it's been a very busy month for you, Paul. Have you managed to gaze starward between your outreach exploits? Well, the weather has been very kind to us at last. Yeah. Um, in fact, the end of last week, I was getting that astronomer's morning stare going on after a full <laughs> week of late night observing. Um, explored Sagittarius, brushed up on a bit of star hopping um, to some of the old favourites in Ursa Major and Cassiopeia. Mm-hmm. Even got an early view of M31 in. I'm always pleased to find Andromeda's back in the sky. That is it's always good to see of, that back yeah, in. Yeah, the season's almost here. Mm. Um, I've had a full month of outreach at Village Fates in the southwest um, with solar scopes wowing the crowds um, and I was invited to a conference at the National Science Learning Centre by the ESERO which is the European Space Education Research Office Mm -hmm. which is the education arm of the European Space Agency Very cool It was a really interesting conference exploring space education in UK primary schools And I believe you have some Ferrero Rocher for us there Mr Ambassador (laughs) Yeah, on the back of that conference um, I'll be working with the good people of the ESERO and ESA um, as one of their space ambassadors Um, I'll be helping schools to improve their STEM particularly encourage work and projects with the European Space Agency Really looking forward to getting kids involved in all sorts of space science events um, and activities next year. It's, uh, it's going to be a really good good year coming up, I think. I'm just going to assume I have diplomatic immunity and you can ignore the London congestion charge from now on. Ferrero? Oh, thank you. Does this mean I have to call you Your Excellency from now on? <laughs> <laughs> OK, enough of the preliminaries. It's time we levelled out and hit the turbulence of this month's news. Well, first place this month has to go to the mission that we were all getting so excited about in last year's end-of-year show. The European Space Agency are finally catching up with Comet. Do you want to say its name, Mr. Ambassador? Cheryomov Gerasimenko. There it is. Okay. Cheryomov Gerasimenko it is, until we butcher its name in some other bizarre pronunciation (laughs) later in this part. Cheryomov Gerasimenko. (laughs) Well, Paul, you all often say that the return of Halley's Comet and the ESA mission to analyse its tail in 1986 was your first astronomy memory, but I think this mission Mm. is really going to be in a different class to Giotto in 1986, if all the instruments work right, because ESA's Rosetta mission goes into orbit around Comet Churyumov-Gerasimenko. Gerasimenko, yeah. It goes into orbit this month, that's if you're listening in August 2014, and the Comet missions in the past, though great technological feats in their own right, have only flown past their comets. This is entirely something else. It's taken a decade to catch up with churyumov Garasimenko and goes into orbit around the comet to analyse it until it either runs out of fuel 
or gets too badly beaten up by particles streaming off the nucleus. And this could be months, m maybe a year, it could even be longer. And ESA did a nice graphic to show the relative size of Comet churyumov gerasimenko to various mountains on Earth. Did you see that one? Paul? Yeah, yeah, it's great, isn't it? It was, yeah. It had the, uh, the Great Pyramids and the Eiffel Tower and other monuments along the bottom and tr semi-transparent mountain sizes and shapes rising up through the middle. And in the centre was the four-mile-wide comet so that you could compare them and their sizes. And it was it really was a nice graphic. And if you were wondering, Mount Olympus in Greece is the mountain that has the closest approximate size. But anyway, ESA has been doing a series of orbital correction burns using the Rosetta spacecraft's thrusters to get its trajectory right to go into orbit around the comet this month. It's actually taken a decade to chase this comet down. And because ESA have been putting lots of information out on their website, which you should go and take a look at, there are loads of little facts to delve into, like, for instance, that the lander called Philae that's going to descend to the surface of the comet is named after the island in the River Nile that has an obelisk with writing in two languages on it that allowed the hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone to be deciphered. So this is not just an astronomy podcast, it's history and linguistics too. Yeah, I reckon. And another nice factoid on the ESA site, the spacecraft has 24 thrusters, each of which provides 10 newtons of force, which they say is about the same as experienced by someone holding a large bag of apples, which I think is really nice That's sweet. It's lovely, isn't it? That's lovely. <laughs> now, they don't say what kind of apples or whether the apples have to be large, only that the bag must be large. So, come on, ESA, if you go into all this trouble, at least tell us if Rosetta's thrusters propel it with the force of a large bag of Granny Smiths or Red Pippins. You might not be aware of this, but I'm actually listed among Sidonia's top Abora culturalists, <laughs> and our green-fingered listeners need to know this kind of mm -hmm. thing. But already in the run-up to orbit around churyumov gerasimenko Rosetta's microwave instrument has shown that the comet is beginning to outgas as it makes its way into the inner solar system. Yeah, it actually um, flared up with a small tail that died yeah. down again, didn't it? It did, yeah, and, and it was good to see, but not unsurprising. It's currently between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars, and when it gets inside Mars's orbit, it should really wake up and start to vent off all that ice in the sun's glare, but already Rosetta shows us that it's releasing the equivalent of two glasses of water every second, which is pretty cool. Not cool that it's venting two glasses of water every second, but cool that they can actually tell Mm. just how much it is venting, you know, to that kind of accuracy. It's just incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, that two glasses is nothing compared to how much it will release as it gets nearer the sun. Yeah, but the uncertainty over how much it will release is what causes the ESA team a few anxieties because comets can have a huge cloud of ejected debris called comas that extend for hundreds or even thousands of miles from the surface in extreme cases, and they want to get into a nice orbit that allows them to analyse and take holiday snaps because Rosetta's got a whole suite of instruments to really examine this comet in detail it's designed to detect the composition of the tail the hazy coma around the nucleus and the composition of the nucleus itself there's a radio sounding instrument to probe the interior and of course it has a high-res camera that we're all getting very excited about and that's before we come on to the cool land of Philae that's going to latch onto the comet in November and then it'll surf it around the sun. Uh, 11th of November is currently scheduled to land on the comet, isn't it? Yeah, and when it does, it'll have about a week of battery power in which to map the chemical composition at the surface, analyse complex organic molecules, because the leading theory for life on Earth is still that it came in the form of complex organics mm. carried to Earth on comets, and it has a whole suite of magnetometers, uh, gas chromatographs, sounding instruments, and a drill to get 20 centimetres into the surface for those oldest accessible geological samples from the early solar system. Yeah, or even before our solar system was born, mm. in, the, in the birth of the sun, though, it's quite possible that the dust caught up in the comet is dust from the nebula that condensed to form our sun and the planets, which is, frankly, a very exciting possibility. And again, this shows just how lucky we are to live in an age when we can not only magnify comets through the technology that telescopes bring us, but we live in a time in history mm. when we can get the outputs and images of a comet from just 30 kilometres away. But already, as Rosetta's got closer and closer to the comet, we got quite a shock. I got a message from you on the 15th of July, Paul, saying, have you seen Rosetta's latest images? The first words of the landing team, I'm guessing, were, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that message got me worried and scrambling for my laptop, thinking something had gone wrong on the spacecraft. But from seeing a white blob a couple of pixels across a few days earlier, we saw just how much Rosetta had caught up to the comet, because in its latest image... Churyumov-Gerasimenko looked not like a single giant snow 
snowball, but like a pair of Siamese twins, contact binaries as they're called, where the comet appears to be two comets gravitationally bound and orbiting together, like the asteroid news story we told you about in last month's show. Mm. And apart from anything else, that could lead to more outgassing and fewer smooth landing sites for the the Philae lander. Yeah, exactly. I I don't think any of us expected this to be a predictable mission, but even weeks before Mm. getting up close to the comet, this mission's already revealed nice surprises with we can only expect more to come so we're going to be talking a lot more about Rosetta and Philae over the coming months I suspect because we're embarking on well the greatest ever examination I think of pristine samples from the birth of the solar system right now and we hope to learn so much about the formation of our solar system and naturally occurring organics in these harshest of environments from Rosetta. Uh, And we take a look at some more dust in our next story. Yeah, that's right. And this time it's how we get all this rich scattering of dust in the universe in the first place because a team using the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope in Chile have been watching dust emerge from a supernova. Which is a job possibility never tell you about at school. Yeah, I never heard that was a job you could train to do from my career's advisor. So, Timmy, you want to watch the first constituents of matter forming from some of the largest explosions in the universe. (laughs) Have you ever thought about becoming a bricklayer or joining the army? (laughs) Perhaps schools need a European Space Agency ambassador. Do you you reckon good for that, Your Excellency? There's a thought. (laughs) (laughs) And this is even more important than it sounds because the very birth of the universe only created hydrogen, helium and a bit of lithium. The stars then fused these elements to make heavier elements like the oxygen that we breathe and the carbon we're largely made of. But it takes supernovas, the death of very large stars, to create all of the 70 or so elements that are heavier than iron. That includes copper and zinc, silver and gold, thorium and uranium. And supernovas also produce the majority of the dust in the universe too. And the dust that emerges from supernovas spreads out across their galaxies and then clumps together with gas and these elements to form element-rich new stars and the rocky planets that we now know litter the galaxy. When you look at the Orion or the Eagle Nebula, you're looking at stellar nurseries where gas condenses under gravity to birth new stars and the dust and heavy elements expelled from supernovas mingle in with all that dust to enrich the elemental composition of those stars and provide them with planets and asteroids. Dust also comes from other processes, but not in the abundances that supernovas provide. So no dust formation from supernovas And in all likelihood, no you and me. And that would, frankly, be a disaster for the universe. If we didn't exist, it would. You're right, yeah. And there's been a bit of a puzzle about how this dust actually can emerge from a supernova because the temperatures and shear force of a supernova should prevent dust grains from surviving and growing. But by taking 10 observations of a supernova in a small galaxy in the constellation Leo over the last two and a half years, astronomers have watched this process happening in visible and infrared light, and it suggests the shock wave that a supernova emits may have cool, dense shells of gas as it races away from the explosion, which is just perfect for the dust to form and grow in a cooler, shielded environment. And again, how impressive is this? The Mm. supernova's 160 million light years away, and yet astronomers can tell how large the dust grains are. One thousandth of a millimetre. And this is actually very large for cosmic dust, and forming in such a large size is likely to have enabled it to then grow and survive the supernova explosion in these shells of cooler gas. Yeah, so we're now able to watch stardust similar to the stuff we're made from, being born millions of years before it becomes the stars and planets and maybe even alien life forms of the distant future. It's these big ideas that makes astronomy so fascinating for me, and the fact that we can watch and understand these processes too. It's incredible. Yeah, amazing stuff. It never ceases to astound me. Well, now that we have settled at our cruising altitude and Ralph has sashayed down the aisle to place his nuts in eager hands, it's time we had our five-minute concept. There is no record of them before 1885. In the whole of human history, no recorded or even anecdotal observation before 1885. Maybe we just never noticed. Maybe they weren't there. But in 1885, a new phenomenon in the night sky was observed, and one that now appears to be ever more common. Noctilucent clouds, night-glowing clouds, thin tendrils of glowing white that appear to haunt the northern sky in the summer months. When they first appeared in 1885, it was thought to be the result of an eruption of Krakatoa two years previously. The world had been treated to spectacular sunsets from shortly after that immense eruption, 
and now these mysterious glowing clouds appear to be the next phenomenon attributed to the ash. But as the ash settled and the sunsets became more normal, the noctilucent clouds remained and have never gone away. Their height is extraordinary when compared to more normal clouds, with altitudes measured at around 85,000 metres, which, when you consider that this is the height we typically observe meteor showers, and that space legally begins 15 kilometres above, you might begin to understand why they have fascinated astronomers as well as meteorologists. This area of the atmosphere is the mesosphere, a layer above the stratosphere and below the thermosphere, which is the realm of the low Earth orbit craft. It is a strange place, which is essentially a vacuum for all practical purposes, and is the coldest naturally occurring place on Earth, with typical temperatures around minus 100 degrees Celsius, and minus 143 having been recorded. Despite the tenuous nature of the mesosphere, this is where most meteors meet their end, colliding with the gas particles and vaporising at speeds of 25 to 160,000 miles per hour. At those speeds, this essentially a vacuum can still provide enough collisions to give us that streak of light. It is poorly explored and the least understood layer of our atmosphere, sitting as it does above the operating height of aircraft and below the orbiting height of spacecraft and is of great interest as it is an atmosphere layer that Earth has in common with Venus and Mars. Indeed, on Mars, a similar cloud at a similar height but composed of carbon dioxide has been observed. So far, we only gain brief glimpses of Earth's clouds with sounding rockets and radar. Radar, because noctilucent clouds are incredibly radar reflective. Scientists are not sure why, but ideas of metallic meteorite dust or deposits of sodium in the mesosphere abound and are argued about. So what are these clouds doing here on the edge of space? Well, what we see is actually the rough edge of a far larger cloud that spans across the polar regions, the polar mesospheric cloud, first reported by astronauts and cosmonauts in the 1970s. This vast cloud is made of a very diffuse scattering of ice crystals that become visible when the sun illuminates it from certain angles. What we see at lower latitudes is the edge of this great cloud illuminated by the sun just below the horizon. What causes these crystals to form is not fully understood, but a combination of meteorite dust, volcanic dust and water vapour drawn up from the lower layers of the atmosphere appear to allow the water crystals to form in the summer months when, surprisingly, the mesosphere is at its coldest. And that is the really odd part. Temperatures at this height and pressure of minus 120 are needed for crystal formation, and that occurs at the pole experiencing summer. This layer actually gets colder during the summer months. So while the north witnesses its mesospheric clouds typically from May to August, the southern hemisphere sees crystal formation in the months after October. It's an interesting footnote that after shuttle launches, back when we had such things, the water vapour from the shuttle's engines would be transported to the polar regions after launch and small noctilucent clouds would form. So we have ice crystals forming on meteorite dust over the polar regions in summer months 85 kilometres up in the atmosphere. But what about that odd observation at the beginning? or rather, lack of observation. How come there is no record of them before 1885? Well, the latest theory, and one that is gaining ground, is that noctilucent clouds are actually an indicator of climate change. They weren't observed before 1885, as the damage from the Industrial Revolution was only just beginning to bite. And it's perhaps no coincidence that their frequency and intensity has been on the increase right through the 20th century. Accepted climate models predict a cooling mesosphere, and this is also the result of release of increased amounts of methane. Maybe as we sit in awe of this beautiful phenomenon in our summer skies, we are actually watching the death of our miner's canary. Well, it's time for the in-flight movie, so snuggle up under a blanket barely big enough for a small cat and recline your seat into the lap of the man behind you, because we have an amazing sequel this month. Returning to chat with us is our old friend Thierry Montmerle, Professor at the Paris Institute of Astrophysics and the General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union. So it's over to you, Ralph. Hi, Thierry, and welcome back to Awesome Astronomy. Hello, hello, Ralph. This is a great pleasure to be with you again. Uh, one year after our last interview, if I'm correct. <laughs> I think it was, yeah. Now, and last time uh, you were on the show, you were telling us about your work with UNESCO to preserve astronomy heritage sites, UNESCO being the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. How's that work going? 
Oh, uh, well, I think the major news that I can tell you since last time we spoke is that uh, there is a major uh, venture that we are embarking on, namely that Chile is uh, will be proposing to put all his uh, its astronomical sites together on the World uh, uh, Astronomical Heritage List. And this is, uh, as you may uh, realize, a very big project because it involves the whole country instead of just one institution or one observatory. So that'll be the ESO scopes, the American scopes, um, all of them that are out there in Chile in the Atacama Desert? Yes, it, it, the idea is precisely that, is that Chile will be the host country and one of the criterion to bid to be put on the World Heritage and Astronomy is that it has international impact. The, 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 the buzzword is outstanding uh, influence, if you like. So the fact that these observatories are international is certainly a big asset and the, the countries will be, the member countries will be associated with that, but Chile as a nation will lead the effort. And at your recent meeting in Canberra, the committee that you sit on endorsed another project that involves UNESCO for the International Year of Light, which next year, 2015, will officially be. Can you tell us about the International Year of Light and the IAU's role? Uh, yes, Ralph. This has been a project that's been pushed by physicists. And so it's a big uh, organization. And the IAU has the experience of having run, uh, you know, from the start, the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. So the International Year of Light is actually, we should be careful about its full uh, title. It's the International Year of Light and Light Technology, mm -hmm. which means that it is very much technology oriented. And the, uh, as understanding, the, the key factor in organizing this, this year is everything that concerns the evolution of light and especially the change of technology from uh, traditional lighting, uh, you know, by uh, electric bulbs to mm -hmm. LEDs. And uh, this can be, uh, the analogy can be the shift from, uh, from analog uh, computing to digital computing. Uh, this is a, uh, absolutely a revolution because you're going to, to be able, or you are already, uh, in a position to, uh, to adjust light to uh, incredible levels of intensity and spectrum. Mm -hmm. And this is very important for astronomy because uh, we know we directly embark on issues like light pollutions and uh, dark sky issues. And if you can control the spectrum of public lighting, for instance, and there are already some efforts being made in this direction by many countries, including Chile that we mentioned earlier, uh, then uh, for astronomy, this is, uh, this is going to be a, a really important factor because it will increase the, the accessibility to dark skies and to solve at least partially the contradiction that you have between, let's say, safety in cities and the access to a dark sky. I mean, you cannot just uh, dark out, you know, uh, every city in the world. You have to, to bring light to people, but you can now do it in a way that is less harmful for astronomical observations. I mean, amateur uh, astronomical observations, for that matter, uh, than before. And then, for instance, 2015 is the centennial of Einstein's theory of relativity. And there will be some events organized by the IU to do some Einstein, the celebration of Einstein. And when the event will, for instance, take place in Potsdam, where there is a very spectacular building in the observatory called the, the Einstein Tower, in which uh, experiments went done on the gravitational constant just by dropping uh, loads and then making very precise measurements. Mm -hmm. So the IU is not running the whole uh, IYL by far, but the IAU has essentially a blank check uh, based on the experience uh, for the International Year Flight to, to do whatever it wants. And uh, I particularly like the fact that this promotes the history of our scientific use of light. And so that's, uh, that gives you a flavor of what we're doing, actually. And you were proud to announce this month that you've also got a new communication strategy at the International Astronomical Union. And I have to say that as part of that, the new IAU website looks really good. What was it that prompted you to modify the website? Oh, well, this with this result from a long discussion. And of course, the old website, uh, you know, was uh, sort of old fashioned and was not very appropriate to communicate quickly uh, the news. And we wanted to make it more dynamic and response uh, and to stimulate actually contribution mm -hmm. from the members and com and communicate better with the public. 
uh, thank you for the for appreciating it. I think we still have uh, progress to make, but you know. It's it's a bit uh, the, the challenge is that we have to cater at the same time to our own professional community and to the public. But okay, I think that the site is more dynamic, is more lively, and uh, yes, indeed, I think it's uh, it's tremendous uh, improvement with respect to to the uh, to the previous situation. Not only in terms of presentation and layout, but also in terms of the spirit that is behind it. Yeah, and I think that although you're a union of professional astronomers, it does show your website that making the general public aware of IAU initiatives and news or announcements is still very important to you. Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, so we we certainly uh, we certainly appreciate that. Yes, and in an area that's really revolutionised the way that we communicate and engage, you now have social media feeds on Facebook and Twitter too. Aha, that's a, that's a big debate among us about the social media. <laughs> yes, uh, for this for this public communication, we have this, and we thought about using it even internally for communication between our members. We know that the the, the younger generation likes perhaps even better Facebook and Twitter than going on a website. Mm -hmm. But this is this is a bit complicated to set up. Uh, it's not sure that the community is ripe uh, is ripe for that, and it also <laughs> needs uh, staffing. You know, people yes. you know to maintain the sites and things like that, and our resources are limited and uh, it. It may be a future evolution uh, after the next General Assembly of next year. And I will not be General Secretary anymore. My uh, my successor will be an Italian, Piero Benvenuti, and we work very closely together. And I know he is very keen on social media and things like that. So uh, we, uh, I recognize that there's a lot of improvement and progress to be made, but this certainly is uh, on our minds and we will try to uh, to evolve in this direction. Well, if people want to go and follow those nice and early, you can do that by searching for International Astronomical Union on Facebook and by following at IAU underscore org on Twitter. And that brings me on to the next big piece of news from the IAU and one that I think will really appeal to our listeners. And it's going under the hashtag name ExoWorlds. And this is really exciting news because you're giving the public an opportunity to name planets outside our solar system and their host stars. Yes, and uh, of course there have been some attempts by some companies uh, to do so, but it was unsatisfactory way for everyone, for the, the companies themselves. Uh, some of them, uh, for instance, uh, uh, wanted to to have some money in exchange of the names, even for you know funding scientific projects. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the way it was done was not uh, was not felt very satisfactory because it was just picking the latest news on an exoplanet that may not even be confirmed. For instance, Alpha Centauri uh, A B, this is the, uh, the the new exoplanet was is not completely confirmed. So I mean, naming an object that may not exist is simply doesn't doesn't make sense to us. <laughs> yeah. And then we decided that, <laughs> that we would respond to the to the, uh, the request of the public, but in a very, very different approach, which is really, uh, you know, based on large numbers. We we discussed a large number of exoplanets, we involved a large number of people, organizations, and in the end, we hope to involve perhaps up to a million people worldwide. This is, uh, you know, the new craze called the crowdsourcing, so yes. in which people participate in scientific decisions and that's exactly our approach and I think this is totally radically new and uh, one of the the first uh, features is exactly what you mentioned is that not only the goal is to name exoplanets but it's really to name what we call exo worlds namely a combination of family if you will of a host star and the planets. It's, you cannot, if you're an astronomer, you cannot separate an exoplanet from its host, its host star. And so far, one of the of the problems we found, conceptual problems about naming exoplanets, is that the host star was left behind. It was not mentioned. Yeah. And in our view, this is really, you know, the same family. It's, jag it's just like dealing with children in a family without mentioning <laughs> the parents. And that's exactly it, because in all likelihood, the exoplanets and the, the host star were formed together. So we're really uh, having a family approach to the problem. And uh, uh, so this family has one, you know, one son or daughter, whatever, and then it may have several, up to five in the list we give. And also there is an issue which has not been tackled uh, satisfactorily in the past, namely a scientific issue, namely are these objects real or not? Are they confirmed or not? And that's exactly what we want to do. We, this is the reason 
why we selected only uh, quote unquote old exoplanet, that most of them are confirmed, or we think to this day are confirmed. And this makes a reliable uh, set of objects. And it's, and it's a large number because we also want that in the end, uh, all the people in the world, all continents have their share in naming these uh, exo worlds. And so there was no question of selecting, you know, one or two, uh, more or less arbitrarily, but rather letting uh, people and organization uh, select them. Uh, so there's a, a sort of two-step involvement of the public. So, so it's a gamble in a way. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns, but the will is there. We have a whole world and a set of exo worlds to offer. And then we have a whole set of people, uh, either in associations or individually volunteers to screen proposals. And so I think we are in a, a totally different dimension. Well, I think it's going to be incredibly popular. And is this something that's going to uh, expand as more and more planets become definitely confirmed? Well, we have in mind that these kind of contests can be renewed something like every three years, every time we convene in general mm -hmm. assemblies. But let's start with the first step. And then we have 2,000 exoplanets out there. Some of them are confirmed, others are not. But this will evolve, of course. And for the moment, we're speaking of, of naming uh, 20 or 30 uh, uh, exo worlds, you know, so that's a limited number, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's already tough to handle. I mean, given given the number of people that we think might in be involved in the process, so it's about ten percent of the systems that we are offering, and I think that's the best we can do. It's really the IU list. And we're very proud of that. We think this is a very reliable list, scientifically reliable. But it may happen, and this has happened recently, that one of the of the uh, planets that we list is in doubt. Uh, well, we will keep it on our list, and and we're not we, we're not sorry for that. On the contrary, we think this has an enormous educational value because it will tell people that you know an exoplanet is an object that results from from very, uh, very complex research. Mm -hmm. And then science is not saying yes and no, black and white. It can, you know, evolve. And then scientists are always questioning themselves. So that's, I think that's also very much in the background of our project is to, to, to bring some questions and educations in astronomy, because we want to foster discussions and reflections about what exoplanets are, uh, how they can be, uh, envision as systems as uh, as uh, you know as having a common origin and why uh, uh, what are the methods and are they reliable now that it's really bringing the public into a scientific issue ah that's a lovely way of summarizing it well i urge everyone to go and follow the international astronomical union's new social media feeds to sign up for their newsletter at www.iau.org and join the contest to name an exoplanet professor thierry montmel Thank you for joining us again on Awesome Astronomy. Well, thank you very much, Rafa. I appreciate it very much, and I hope I haven't uh, talked too much. <laughs> Not at all. It's always wonderful speaking to you. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with me, Thierry, and, and I hope you have a nice weekend. Thank you very much, Raf. Uh, hope to talk to you some other time. Well, before we ask for tray tables to be raised and seats to be returned to their upright position, it's time to delve into the world of Q&A, the part of the show where you are in charge. Our first question this month comes from Lee Garner in Norwich, UK, and he says, Ula Martian overlords. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Where, in your opinions, does the solar system truly end? Thanks. Your faithful servant, Lee. Faithful servant. Mm. Thanks for that, Lee. It's about time we got some respect. You may be spared. Definitely. So where does the solar system end? Well, the answer's in the question, really, because the solar system, by definition, is the extent of our sun's influence. There is no International Astronomical Union definition for what the solar system is, so ever since Copernicus and Galileo showed us that we don't have a geosystem, that is, Earth isn't the dominant force in our larger space environment, the term solar system has just grown up to mean the dominion of the sun. 
But to say the solar system ends where the sun no longer has any influence is clearly a semantic answer, and that doesn't get at the kind of answer that I think you're looking for. You want to know where the physical boundary of the solar system is. And that's a lot tougher because we have to revisit the sun's influence and ask, how does it influence objects that are far away? In the outer reaches beyond the gas giant planets, it has an influence in terms of its gravitational pull and the stream of charged particles that its nuclear heart generates. So we're looking at where the sun's gravity and the solar wind weaken to the point of being less influential than the gravity of other stars or the stream of cosmic particles from distant supernovas. And as you'd expect, these have two different answers and a rather pedantic way to try and settle this debate. If we take the magnetic influence of the sun first, the boundary where the sun's particles, the solar wind, gives way to the more dominant cosmic rays is around 121 astronomical units, or 18 billion kilometres. The news that Voyager 1 crossed this boundary, known as the heliopause, was bolstered and confirmed last month, so we can be confident of that. In this case, we can say not that the solar system ends there, but that the interstellar medium begins there. Not an entirely comfortable explanation, because we have those pesky solar system runs that orbit our sun but spend much of their time in this interstellar medium. And a month or two ago, we brought you the news of a new dwarf planet called 2012 VP113, whose closest point in its orbit is halfway between Pluto and the interstellar medium, and spends 80% of its orbit in interstellar space. Dwarf planet Sedna has an orbit that takes it to eight times further from our sun than the boundary of interstellar space, so that's way out there, and yet it's still gravitationally part of the solar system. If the Oort cloud, that we think throws comets towards the sun on a regular basis, exists, then that forms a gravitationally bound ring of icy debris around our sun more than a light year away. That's 400 times further than the start of the interstellar medium and a quarter of the way to the next nearest star. In fact, it's quite possible that our Oort cloud merges with the Alpha Centauri star system's Oort cloud, which would make it the gravitational boundary of our solar system because every object beyond our Oort cloud would be gravitationally bound to other stars. But because you asked where the solar system ends, and I can't give you a definitive answer, I asked the person in the best position to answer this, the General Secretary of the International Astronomical Union, to give us his thoughts. It's just like being in a house. I mean, you know, the, the heliopause is being our home. The heliopause, the end of the heliosphere, the region which is pushed by the solar wind, and that Voyager has recently crossed after many, many years of doubt now. This, it's well established that it has. Now, if you want to look out of the window and, and see uh, where you are and where is your home, then you have the so-called local interstellar medium. And then this local interstellar medium still has objects that are gravitationally connected to the sun. So this is your garden, so to speak. Yeah. And so depending on which, uh, which way you're considering, then, I mean, there's no reason to choose one over the other the house of the garden so there you have it from the best authority we have neither answer is more valid than the other it's your choice so our next question comes from lou of at tweets by lou on twitter and she asks what's a vampire star well we need to start with the first really and that can only mean max shrek uh now while nosferatu really is not a full adaptation of stoker's dracula shrek really set the tone for what a vampire on film should be like and stars mate stars not acting stars, stars, you know, uh, twinkly yeah, stars. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, in that case, Lou is talking about blue stragglers, uh, which have been a baffling type of star. Um, we have understood them more. They've earned the nickname vampire star. So what are we talking about here? Well, these stars were first observed in 1953 by Alan Sandage, who, by the way, discovered quasars and gave the first accurate answer to the Hubble constant. He observed during some photometry of globular cluster M3 that there were some very blue stars that shouldn't be there. Now, that needs qualifying. Hopefully you're at least partly familiar with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. If you aren't, and you call yourself an astronomer, pause this podcast now and go look it up for shame on you, as it's the foundation of our modern understanding of stars and stellar evolution. I'll wait while you do. Another beer, mate? Oh, yeah, yeah, why not? How long do you think they'll be? Actually, I, I told them to pause, I suppose, so we, we could just carry on. Oh, good point. Do you want some of my nuts? Uh, okay, so now you have at least seen a HR diagram and hopefully know what I mean by the term main sequence. 
Well, the line running diagonally across the diagram is the main sequence, and stars, when stable and perfectly formed, sit on that line and over time move up it until they turn off to the right and become some category of giant and enter an old star's home to be patronised by a 16-year-old care worker before ending it all in a massive bout of stellar incontinence. <laughs> now, when we look at clusters, we can measure the age of the cluster by seeing how many stars have reached, been through, or have yet to reach this turn-off stage. An old cluster will have a large number of stars that have already turned off the main sequence, while a young cluster will typically have stars along the main sequence and a few that have turned off. It is more complex than that to a degree, but you get the basic idea. Now, you may also have noticed on the HR diagram that as you go up the diagram, mass increases. So a star on the top left of the diagram is a massive short-lived star, while a star near the bottom right will be a red long-lived star. This means an old cluster will have few blue stars and be made up of predominantly smaller, long-lived red stars and bigger stars that have turned off and become red giants. What an old cluster shouldn't have is a large number of blue stars, as these are typically hot, high-mass and short-lived. So, these stars should have gone by the time we are looking at them. Blue stragglers seem to defy this theory by being hot blue stars high on the main sequence of the HR diagram in what are otherwise old clusters. In the normal theory of stellar evolution, they shouldn't be there, so what are they? Well, theories range from captured young stars, new stars reborn in the cluster from collisions, or even that they are actually foreground stars. Now, all these possibilities appear to have been ruled out, though, and the theory that appears to currently stand up has gained them the nickname vampire stars. That is, stars that have given themselves an extended life or rejuvenate themselves by feasting on other stars, thereby increasing mass, supplementing their fuel, and avoiding that all-important turn off the main sequence earlier in their lives. This appears to be borne out by the frequency of blue stragglers within the cores of globular clusters, where interstellar distances can be as little as a few light minutes or hours. This means there is a far greater chance for stars to interact, and some to fall as prey to others having their upper layers stripped away by a star of greater mass. So vampire stars are just that, a star that sucks the life from other stars and thereby extending its own existence, better known as blue stragglers. Well, it's time to land this crate and stagger off bleary-eyed into the hot, sweaty customs lounge so Damien can be strip-searched by a mustachioed customs officer called Sue. Ralph can nip to the toilet and get creative with his bodily hiding places while I pick John up from the luggage carousel. And wherever you're enjoying the summer sun, don't forget that we have video versions of the Sky Guide on our YouTube channel, which you can find by typing Awesome Astronomy into the YouTube search bar. We have a vibrant Facebook group that you can find in the same way over on Facebook, and if you like the show but haven't left a review on iTunes yet, please do, as it does help push us up the listings to bring astronomy to more people. And for those of you that don't worship at the altar that is Apple, you can still download us to your heart's content. If you use Android devices, you can download a free podcast player such as Podcast Addict or Podcast Republic straight to your device from Google Play and use that to search for us. And if you use a Windows phone, you can do exactly the same from the Windows Store using any of the free apps such as Podcasts or the Podcast Source. Before we sign off, it's worth mentioning again that September sees the return of Astro Camp. Just seven weeks to go when we release this episode. We'll have a talk from Cardiff University's Jenny Millard on galaxies and dark matter, a talk from the BBC Sky Knight's Chris North on the Herschel Space Observatory, and this time not one, not two, but three astronomy-themed quizzes with great prizes. And that's in addition to the beginner's tutorials from Pat Franks and our own Damien and the UberDocs guys for three nights. So that's from the 20th to the 23rd of September and it's all included in your admission price of £38 per adult, £20 per teenager and 15 quid for kids. It's in the International Dark Sky Reserve of the Brecon Beacons so the skies are absolutely awesome and we especially welcome absolute beginners. So don't worry, even if you don't have a scope of your own there'll be plenty here for you to look through. So take a look for Astro Camp on Facebook and at the Astro Camp on Twitter and you can book now at www.astrocamp.org.uk We'll see you there. It's now time to announce our Yuri Gagarin competition winners. Winning the DVD, Gagarin First in Space, is Jen McKenzie in London, um, Sammy Selick in Cornwall, Andrew Burns in Reading, and the book, Yuri Gagarin the First Spaceman, is Sheila Hokum in Indiana. So thank you very much to Fetch Publicity for giving us these prizes to give away, and congratulations to everybody who won this month. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the prizes. 
Well, that's all from us until the September Sky Guide comes out later in the month. We're all off to a British-themed beachside pub to sup up the Mediterranean ambience and watch Damien get in a fight with a large tan bloke from Chigwell over the finer points of the offside rule. So, have a great summer, everyone, and it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Ralph Wilkins, Paul Hill, Damian Phillips, and John Wildridge, and is free to distribute for educational purposes. Music is courtesy of Star Salzman. For more astronomy news, views, help and advice, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can join in the astronomy discussion on our Facebook group, and you can follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on the show. You can send them to us by Facebook, Twitter, or by email at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. I, I was noticing the, the 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 Russian competition not that popular this month. Really, yeah. <laughs> the uh, Gagarin DVD competition, which was really popular before the annexation yeah. of the Ukraine, and it was amazing afterwards. how popular it was about two months ago. <laughs> really popular last month, not so much this month. Not, not really this month. <laughs> <laughs> this month. <laughs>